Okay, good afternoon everyone, welcome. My name is Monica Skonechna and I'm the manager of TIFED, also known as the Trate Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design. Welcome to today's seminar titled, Why We Need Mining to Save the Environment. We are happy to co-host this event in partnership with STEAM, Sustainability and Engineering at McGill, and I will let our co-host uh, say a few words about STEAM. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Nikki Lau, and I'm one of the co-chairs of STEAM this year. So STEAM, we're Sustainability and Engineering at McGill. We're the undergraduate committee that's kind of preoccupied with promoting sustainability and sustainability-related initiatives on campus for undergrads specifically. So we're super excited to be hosting this talk because Sustainability can be applied in every engineering discipline, and we're super excited to share about it in mining. So yeah. That's great. So before we start, I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of TISED and STEAM, acknowledge that we, and the University of McGill, is located on traditional lands of indigenous people. And we recognize and thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which the peoples of the world now gather. A few housekeeping items before we kick off. So for those who are online, feel free to um, put in your questions in the chat. We will have an opportunity for a Q&A at the end and a little bit of a discussion. For those in the room, you'll just raise your hand as you would normally. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, we are very uh, happy to welcome Alf Gora. Um, Alf is a McGill alumni. Um, he is a founder and principal consultant of Bora Consulting, a firm focused on helping mining companies improve their asset management and maintenance challenges and achieve operational excellence. He is the author of Mining is the Future and is passionate about making mining greener, more sustainable, and more attractive for new generations. He hopes to increase awareness of the importance of mining and metals in our everyday lives and the electrification of tomorrow's economy. Like I mentioned, he is an alumni. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering from McGill. And with that, the floor is yours, Al. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everybody, and those joining us online. Um, since Monica introduced already, I won't spend too much time talking about myself. My name is Alp. I'm a mechanical engineer. After spending a decade in the industry, mostly in operations, I, in January 2021, I launched my own consulting firm, uh, focused on operational excellence uh, for mining companies. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the mining industry. And I'm going to talk to you about the sustainability and what it takes to make sustainable mining a reality. As part of housekeeping, I just want to clarify a couple of terms first. When I say mining, I'm not just talking about digging a hole in the ground, so just not extraction. I also include the mineral processing, so that would be the mine to mill, smelting, refining processes, all the way to port. Since uh, 2021, in the last couple of years, throughout my travels uh, for working for mining companies, uh, mining projects in North America and uh, Africa, uh, West Africa, Gabon and Madagascar, I've noticed a gap, a gap in communication. In mining, we have a purpose. We have a purpose. We provide, provide the raw materials to build the world as we know, the cars, technologies. At least that's my definition. Most of the industry, we know what we do and why we do it and why it matters. Then as soon as you get outside this mining bubble, we face communities who are strongly opposed to mining or we face individuals who absolutely no interest nor awareness of mining. And that's why I'm here. My mission is to close this gap, to make mining more accessible, um, share the story of mining, the role and the importance of mining in our lives and hopefully improve the perception of, of the field. All right, let's get started. In the last uh, five years, we've seen a shift in auto manufacturers' approach to raw materials. GM, Tesla, Ford, more and more they became, incre uh, they became interested in mining companies. They are looking at mining companies to secure their raw materials for their supply chain, and especially around the battery metals. And of course, this comes as a Increasing, ever increasing demand in electric vehicles. Last year, EV sales hit the tipping point. 10% of the global car sales were electric. So what basically what it says is uh, the sales are slow until the number hits 10%, then the sales take off. In other words, 
you buy an electric vehicle because you saw your neighbor installing a charging station. You saw your neighbor charging, uh, installing a charging station at home. Couple neighbors do the same. Now suddenly everyone has a brand new Tesla in their driveway. And this trend is encouraged by our politicians. In US and Canada, more and more we are pushing this agenda. North American governments are targeting car sales to be 100% electric by 2035. And we are told this is going to save the environment. But I got a question for you here. How clean do we think an electric vehicle really is? I mean, you compare an electric vehicle to an internal combustion engine, sure, yes, there's no direct carbon emissions from an EV. But the carbon emissions are heavily impacted how the power is generated at first place, right? I mean, the CO2 can be emitted at the power generation at the grids. In Canada, for example, Quebec, British Columbia, we are gifted with abundant clean hydropower. What about other provinces, Nova Scotia, Saskatchewan, Alberta, who still rely heavily on fossil fuel power generation? Then there are the metals and minerals, the raw materials to build these electric vehicles. Aside from the structure of the car, so it takes an aluminum and steel, aside from the, those two metals, electric vehicle uses six times more metals and minerals than a reg regular car. Cobalt, nickel, manganese, copper, that's just more metals that we need to mine and process. So, I believe that the future of transportation involves us moving away from fossil fuel, sure. But as much as we love uh, silver bullets to some of our existential questions, this push for electric vehicles means little in our fight against climate change. And if we are not careful, we may cause even more problems. And unfortunately, the renewable energy technologies share a similar story. If we think the top of mind uh, electric, uh, renewable tech, right? Wind turbines and solar panels. To fully offset the fossil fuel power generation, the raw material required to build this technology is monumental. Again, going back to copper and uh, this, this critical minerals, the raw material requirement is monumental. According to a study by Simone Michaud, and I'll, I'll put the link, please, it's a great reading. It's a long, but a great reading. According to his study that was uh, published very recently, we will need 2 million new turbines and 27 billion new solar panels. Now, that's a lot of, lot of material that needs to be. Going back to Simone Michaud, his study, we're going to need 27 billion new solar panels and 2 million new wind turbines. And that's just more metals that we need to mine and process. I think at this point uh, we can safely say that the mining is an integral part of our transition for a clean future, right? But considering that mining, and I'm just talking about the extraction processes, is responsible for 7% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, doesn't include the refining processes or the smelting processes. If mining isn't clean, can we call renewable energy clean? It's going back to my question about the electric vehicles, how clean do we think a wind turbine really is? And it is not. I mean, mining first must become greener. We have to achieve sustainable mining for us to call renewable energy clean. So today I'm going to talk about the next 20 minutes about how we can make, implement the sustainable mining or the Im, 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 embed the sustainability within the mining industry. I call this the sustainability culture in mining. And the reason I say culture because I want to move beyond, the, beyond statistics. I want to create a care factor, a, a deeper bond within the industry and with its end users, with its customers. At this point, I'd like to draw a parallel to a transformation around the safety culture. Let's draw a parallel to a safety culture that was built in the industry. 
several decades ago, and it is working, at least in North America, it is working. And I think we can use the same recipe around sustainability. And it happens to be one of the most inspirational leadership stories in the industry. In 1987, uh, Paul O'Neill became the CEO of Alcoa. Alcoa is the American largest aluminum producer. At his first press conference, we expect the same thing from the new guy, right? He's going to talk about the productivity, stock, uh, stock prices, cash flow, and he's going to share his vision on how we can increase all these metrics. But that's not what happened. At his first press conference, Mr. O'Neill talked about one thing and one thing only. He talked about the workplace safety. He said, and I quote, every year numerous Alcoa workers are injured so badly that they miss a day of work. I intend to make Alcoa the safest company in America. I intend to go for zero injuries. Unusual, audience a bit confused. Couple journalists raise their hands and they ask questions about the inventory levels or uh, what about the cash flow, the stock price, right? <laughs> Mr. O'Neill wasn't interested. He said, I'm not certain you heard me. If you want to understand how Alcoa is doing, you need to look at our safety figures. Now, this was a total shock to Wall Street. I mean, who is this guy? He's going to ruin the company. <laughs> but Paul O'Neill had a plan. He knew he had to transform the company, and he, need, he knew he had to improve the production processes. He also knew that he needed his people, his employees, to lead this transformation. And something about a cash flow, something about the stock price wouldn't be enough to rally his people. He needed to create a journey with a strong purpose. And the purpose was safety. Now, this would speak to the heart of his people because it was the right thing to fight for. Paul O'Neill's fight for safety didn't just turn around the accident rates. It made the whole company better. Since focusing on the worker safety meant studying the production processes in detail, the improvements also made things run better. Now, this wasn't an overnight transformation. It took him several years. But he proved that we can improve safety while improving profits. Why can't we use the same recipe around sustainability? Especially considering that our goal is to meet our needs today without compromising the ability of our children and grandchildren to meet their own needs. I think that's a hell of a purpose and a great source of motivation. No? But we have to make this more tangible, more, more visible. It's still very high level to implement this, the sustainability culture I'm talking about. The solution that I propose here, it's a, it's a three-step process to, 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 to challenge the industry standards within and improve the public's perception of the field. I call this framework AIM, Awareness, Investment, and Mindset. Today, I'll talk about the awareness and the mindset piece. Just one second. All right. Sustainability starts with awareness, among many other things. And it has everything to do with the public's perception. Because without the understanding and support of a well-informed public, a fundamental change is just not possible. Otherwise, we'll continue to see communities protest or, or young professionals joining the industry. Now, I've been working on raising awareness around the metals and minerals in the products that we buy. It is so much harder than it looks. Because as it stands, we have to go out of our way to learn about these metals and minerals in our products. But what if this information was available? What if this information about metals and minerals was available and similar to our food or drinks Available like ingredient lists or the nutrition label on our food. What if we scan a QR code on my Pepsi can 
and we could see what metals were used. It would be aluminum in this case. How was it mined as a bauxite, then transformed into alumina, then aluminum? Then how was it manufactured in the ca this, this, this can? And what was its carbon footprint throughout this process? Is basically its journey from the mine to us. Now, this would help raise awareness and close the gap between the mining and the consumers, right? Is it even possible? I mean, did I just dream about this? The technology is getting there, thanks to blockchain technology. And I'm not talking about the cryptocurrency here, guys. Some companies already started to use blockchain to provide transparency and traceability on their supply chain. One example, one initiative that's getting traction is a project called Start from Rio Tinto. I believe their focus is around aluminum. So in the case of my Pepsi can, this example could become a reality. Another initiative is from World Economic Forum. It's uh, called Carbon Tracing Platform among seven uh, mining companies, the Glencore, Anglo-American, Tata Steel. So the technology is there. Our technology is, is, is getting there. On the flip side of this amazing progress in the technology, the pushback that I'm hearing from the mining companies is the fear of vulnerability, fear of transparency, fear of showing our hands and potentially losing our competitive advantage. To this, to quote uh, Ben Franklin right after signing the Declaration of Independence, we must all hang together or surely we shall hang separately. In this fight against climate change, we should all act together. Otherwise, we'll just hit the point of no return. So going back to the awareness piece, awareness piece, let's be that catalyst. Let's ask our questions about the metals and minerals in the products. Next time you buy an iPhone, Apple product, or any car, let's ask the questions, what metals and minerals are used, how they were sourced. Now, I can't promise that we'll get the answers you're looking for, now right away at least, but this will only happen if we start this conversation. And as a result, as a result, this chain of information will make it all the way to us. Then we can make informed decisions in our products. We'll choose, just like comparing the sugar content on a soft drink, we'll choose brands that use responsibly mined and low emission mining products. And I believe, I believe once we have this visibility, it will change the way the industry operates. Now here's the thing. Um, awareness is a critical point, but it would be wishful thinking that raising awareness, consumer awareness, is enough. Which brings to my, my, my second point today with you guys, is the mindset shift. Mindset shift within the industry. There are still a lot of improvements to do within the industry. I, I've, I've been seeing a lot of improvements already with respect to the environmental or ESG or decarbonization, the mining companies, but there's still a lot of improvements required. The good news is in 2021, so two years ago, ICMM, International Council on Mining and Metals, basically it's a group of 28 world's largest mining companies. They made a promise, they made a commitment, they said, Mining will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions and will achieve net zero by 2050. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a great news, right? Finally, the miners all agreed on one common goal with a clear deadline. Now, the focus initially is on the scope one and scope two emissions. Briefly, scope one emissions are the, the carbon emissions or GHG emissions directly from their processes, so from their engines, furnaces, boilers. And the scope two emissions are more indirect uh, emissions are 
associated with the electricity purchases. Again, this is a great first step. One of my concerns and one of my main concerns is the year 2050. I mean, that's still 27 years away, right? Uh, most of the executives who committed to this plan, they're going to be retired by then, or, or worse. Uh, so the accountability piece could fall apart. The second, there's still no clear game plan on scope three emissions yet. Scope three emissions, basically, on other words, there's no clear game plan on how to reduce the emissions from the customers of mining companies, the steel producers or the manufacturers. Now, don't get me wrong, guys. This is a great first step in the right direction. It's a little slow, in my opinion, and there's a big accountability burden placed on the next generation. Because let's call a spade a spade here. It's going to be our generation, the millennials and the Gen Zs, who's going to make this happen. Along with this push from ICMM, I also see a push in the corporate presentations. The business adopted this language, you know, more and more in, in social media, in the podcasts I'm listening, in the um, conferences. Business adopted this language. We talk about the ESG, we talk about decarbonization. Awesome. What about the frontline workers? Are they engaged in this fight against climate change? Let me share a personal story on this. For a good part of the last 10 years, I've been in, in operations role. I had the chance to work as a frontline maintenance supervisor. And FYI, the maintenance team's main responsibility is to keep equipment available for production. In production, we say every minute lost is lost forever, so you better keep producing. Every now and then, we would have an oil spill on a diesel generator, on a, on a haul truck. So whenever that happens, our first instinct is to fix the machine and put it back in operation as soon as possible. What about the oil spill? We'll clean it quickly, because I don't want to deal with the environmental team. Otherwise, they're going to ask me to dig a hole so we don't contaminate the soil. And they'll probably ask me to do a root cause analysis so it doesn't happen again, which is the right thing to do. But for a good part of the first half of my career, I fought against the environmental team because I didn't understand that I didn't have the feeling they understood the production requirements. I also worked for companies who were a lot more stringent on environmental incidents. But what I'm saying is workers go through various versions of this scenario for different companies. The sad part of this story, this didn't happen in the 70s or 80s. This was a few years ago. So the moral of the story is without getting our frontline workers engaged, without their commitment, there's just not possible to attain sustainability in, environment, in, in mining industry, no matter what's being said and written on a corporate presentation. And, and not just as a buzzword to sh appease shareholders, or it's not just something to get the permit to operate, but as a part of our diligence for ourselves and our children. Now, if you think this is a pipe dream, I, I, I may be more optimistic than you are because I look at the future of the industry and it's promising. Again, no matter what's being written and said about the Gen Zs, I work more and more with young professionals who care, who care about the environment, who care about the society, and they have the heart in the right place. So for me, this, this sustainability culture in mining is just not, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of time. Please remember, mining is an integral part of our future. It's an integral part of our lives, and it is an integral part of our transition for a clean future. The industry needs a little push to embrace the sustainability mindset, and, and we are the catalyst to speed up that process. And more importantly, and this is the most important message of the day, come join the mining industry. If you think mining 
should do better, if you think mining needs to be fixed, what's the better way than doing, doing it while working for a mining company? And as a cherry on top, it pays very well too. In mining, we don't just dig a hole in the ground, guys. We build the world. We build the future of the world. Let's do it sustainably together. Thank you. And I'll have your questions now. Thank you. Right. In their own life. So, uh, that I, do, well, do you think, uh, or would you expect that that level of, of engagement just conversationally would, um, would have a, a fast impact on what the expectations are for, for mining? And, and do you think that that's the main thing that has been missing to, uh, for example, engage uh, yeah. frontline workers is sort of accountability at home or even, even local fight, even domestic problems in their own community? Right. So there's a two aspects to it, right? There is the, the, the miners, the people working in the mining industry. Uh, as I mentioned, they, most of them, they, they, we know what we do. We know why we mine. There's a purpose to it. And even at that level, we still have a little fight to get them engaged in this mindset. I think that's going to be easier fight than dealing with in Chicago, in Montreal, in Toronto, so far from mining, to get these people to care about mining and even start the, the reflection or questioning about that. You know, uh, the, uh, you probably heard the saying, you know, did you know that an iPhone has over 20 different metals and minerals in it? I've been keeping saying that I'm more, every time I'm getting, oh really, well yes. But how are we going to get this, 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 this reflection, this thinking to, to people in, in bigger cities who are not in the industry? And uh, we've got to start talking. We've got to start talking. And which is the reason I go back to the, the, my Pepsi can. Let's make the information available. The technology is there. They just don't want to show it yet. Right. <laughs> right. 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 So, in terms of educational piece, that I think there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of room to improve there, uh, because you look at the movies like Avatar, you look at the the the, the one with the seven dwarfs, uh, the. The, the reputation is terrible all along, you know, I mean, like miners is, you go in the coal mine, it's dirty, it's, so we are fighting against this, you know, so I come, come here, you know, uh, and, and he's talking about the mining and trying to show the nicer part or the, the, the important part of the mining and how it affects the, the humanity. We are constantly fighting against this, this, this reputation. And of course, the fact that it is one of the industries that comes to mind when something terrible happens doesn't help the narrative, right? It's very rare that we talk about the mining in news as a, as a, as a part of a good news when there was a bribery or tailing pump failure or, or safety issues, then we hear about mining. So there's a big um, educational uh, fight that we have in front of us. Thanks, Alex. with material styles of living existence versus viewing the natural world as object objectively separate 
a resource in which we can extract from for exceptional economic growth and to be dominated at or ultimately to control. Okay. And the question is? I'm going to answer the part of the question I understood. Uh, we often talk about, uh, when we talk about the clean energy, you know, uh, the company, the, the governments are pushing for this electric vehicles as it's the, the greatest thing since the sliced bread, right? Of course, it has its, its pros and cons, but uh, we're going to require metals and minerals for that. And uh, what bothers me the most is that before making this pledge, the governments didn't necessarily go talk with the mining companies to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to say we're going to go for net zero. Do we have the raw materials? Do we have the infrastructure for that? We often talk about recycling about that, right? Because part of the sustainability, and considering that most of the metals, the, the, the copper, steel, aluminum, uh, among others, are recyclable, and some of them forever. So the recycling is, is, is a piece that we need to uh, explore further, but it's still uh, on that front as well. We have still a lot of room to, imp to go off in. Yeah. I'm sure I didn't answer his question, but uh, I'm happy to take it offline. Gary, did you have a question? Yeah. I have a question. So I teach economics here. Yes, sir. Yes. Environmental people are. Yes. So, what drives the mindset is the incentives, is the rewards. So, don't you think that the mining industry has to reprioritize their priorities and change the reward incentive system to make it such that protecting the land, uh, cleaning up after sales, yep. preventing leaching is just as important as. Any absolutely, absolutely. Which is the which goes back to my example about the alcohol, right? And Paul O'Neill. What I like about that story is that uh, for anybody who worked in the, the mining company, at least in North America, uh, we have the safety culture really embedded there. You know, for example, every day, every meeting starts with a safety share, and a lot of mining companies have safety as a core value. Same with sustainability mindset. What if we put that as a part of our core values, you know, the, the going back to the E's and the S of the ESG? Leave the G a bit aside, you know, governance. What if we put that in the part of our core values and just focusing on it? That's, that's the only way we're going to be able to improve this. Corporate presentation is, is, is one of the levers. But uh, to speak to the hearts of people, getting the, our frontline workers to to care about the environment as much as the production, th there are several things that needs to be happened. For example, the reason I was so focused on my production is because my bonus was linked to my production levels, right? So it all goes back to a bit the finances a little bit at the end. It is greenwashing, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you got one there, yeah. So the increasing the commodity prices would have an impact on the, on the life of people because uh, like the incomes are not for every yeah. uh, everything yeah. you know, increasing every time you buy Yeah, yeah. I you gotta think about this man. I don't know like this top of my mind, top of my head. It's a good question, I gotta think about it. Let's take it offline after this.
my YouTube channel. Uh, that's nice. Uh, sure. I'll wire transfer later. Uh, you give me his number. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I, we'll link it. yeah, we'll link it. It's outpourinc.com. It's uh, okay, so easy. Advantage of society, of, uh, which part? The m what, mining? Uh, I think it's the same person here. It says, um, what are the negative and undesirable consequences of the mine for the, for the future? Oh, that, that list goes long, right? That's a, that's a grocery list that unfortunately that we still got to fight with that. I mean, uh, I can talk about the, the good part of mining, but there's still a uh, lot of negatives. I, I mean, it's not all rainbows and unicorns, right? Let's, let's Let's, let's be honest about that. Uh, it's, uh, when I say sustainable mining, you know, you may, the one question might be, uh, isn't it ox oxymoron? Because, I mean, you, you dig a hole, you take the materials, and you leave it nothing behind. So the, in terms of impact to the environment is, it, it is negative. So we have to come up with ways to, to make the most out of what we have. So, uh, and uh, in, in part of the mindset shift within the, this framework, that's what I'm focusing on about how can we leverage the, the mining companies in, in the remote locations. Couple examples I have, when I go to Africa and I see this is very, uh, it's, it's, it's very obvious is how much mining is impacting the lives of people there. It's like a lottery for a lot of people. That mining company goes to a town, it is made it. Now the question that I don't have an answer that I'm thinking, and uh, I joined different podcasts and conferences to come up with, with something more tangible answer is, what happens after the life of mine ends and the mining company leaves the town? Now how do we leave a lasting, lasting uh, result uh, impact in the community? That's an open ended question that I don't have an answer yet. Sarah, did you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I have a ton of questions. Uh, well, I guess the first one about, um, I thought there was an interesting question about the price and sustainability. It is, it is really easy. But also, and I don't want to put you on a question too much that you just said you wanted to take offline, but um, it got me thinking because there are a lot of questions about supply constraints with the increasing materials that will be required for renewables, et cetera. So presumably one might imagine a world where the price increases due to constraints making potentially opportunity for a better development and design for sustainability. So I'd like, first of all, your comments on that. And then second, if we think through, you know, you talked a little bit about culture, a lot about culture and mindset. Mm -hmm. might be online or in the room, they're thinking through, you know, hey, I'm interested in this industry, I care about clean energy, I care about EVs, uh, and I want to reduce the impacts of these mines. What would you suggest as the key kind of design and operational parameters that you would emphasize as most important for their, them to oh, think yeah. about if they're interested in becoming involved with a uh, type of career path? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the second question is, 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 was part of my initial talk that I removed it because time constraint is the circular economy. Absolutely. We need to start uh, teaching our people about the circular economy. I had to take a course outside paying my own to learn about the circular economy. And uh, that's something that the, we need to train our people uh, and students on what it is. And I think the engineers play an important role in that. It's about uh, how can we design for sustainability? You know, going back to my production is can we, can we design for sustainability uh, and maybe change processes ac in, according to that? Um, my background is engineer, and uh, mining is a very engineer uh, dominant field. I think it's, it's not like it doesn't do them us any favor. And I'm going to say this, uh, it's a lot of mechanical engineers, a lot of engi electrical engineers, of course, mining engineers. And uh, we can use 
uh, other other fields, joining the field, uh, bring their perspectives about about things, and um, and there are opportunities as well. A, a lot of mining companies are due to the fact that they are struggling to find um, new uh, workers, new generation. So there are a lot of opportunities in that, in that sense. Regarding the, the price of the, the commodities now, I think, uh, let's look at the copper and the lithium example. Right? Lithium is the, the common denominator for all the battery technologies. We talk about the NMC batteries, uh, nickel, manganese, uh, cobalt, or now it's LFP coming up, the lithium, uh, phosphate, um, and iron. Uh, we know we have enough in terms of reserves. We don't have enough operating mines to provide enough lithium. So going back to my comment about the governments, did anybody spoke to mining companies saying that, hey, we're going to go in this direction. Are you going to be able to provide the raw materials to back us up right now as we speak? No. So this situation is going to increase the prices, most likely, is going to push us to come up with new technologies, new alternatives, absolutely. Because we're going to hit a point that, OK, this is just not a possibility anymore that we need a substitute for that. The question started with, the, right, how can we substitute copper, for example, in uh, transmission lines? So we've got the silver, aluminum. One is too expensive other one, but the thinking started in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, um, in, uh, oddly short and sweet. In your opinion, you work with a lot of uh, mining companies across you know, various geographical locations. Uh, I'm curious to know if any have implemented ESG in your opinion as well, and what were the strategies that they used to implement that? Um, I haven't seen a company personally that did this 100% uh, successful A to Z. I've seen a lot of good stories. I've seen a, a mine site, that's it's a mine and a mineral processing, went fully, they will be fully uh, on the renewable energy with the wind turbines and solar panels. They are completely eliminating the diesel generators because they don't have access to grids. They had to create their own electricity using power generators. And uh, they, put, they put the solar panels in place, the wind turbines in construction. By the end of next year, they will be fully renew on renewable energy. So that's, that's a huge win, in my opinion. Especially that I work in the northern Quebec that we were 100% Rely, uh, dependent on diesel generators, this is a huge win. Now, this is the E part of the ESG, right? For the S part of the ESG, I also work in, in Africa with a mining company. They built the city, and everything they touch basically turns into, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but turns into, uh, into gold. You know, they, they build the hospital, they built the school, they train people, they train the trades. And that, that uh, I've, I haven't seen that kind of commitment anywhere in Canada that I've seen in, in, in Africa. Mm. So there are good stories, uh, but I haven't seen a company, unfortunately, that does it uh, A to Z properly yet. What's your strategy to implement that? Oh, Lisa, that's a tough question, Lisa. <laughs> well, uh, we got a. Uh, Read the book. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> I'm waiting for my signed copy. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, sure, sure, sure. One question. Two part? Two part. Oh, I love those. With increased sustainability in mind regarding the frontline workers in mining, will there be a massive change in their day to day jobs or is this more of an education process? Yeah. So it is an educational process to start with. It's going to have an impact on their day-to-day, -day, no question about it. Let's start with awareness piece. Let's start with educational piece, absolutely. But it will have a huge impact on, because we may have, we're going to have to redesign the way the processes is done. We, have, we will have to redesign some of these things to make it more sustainable. But uh, first step is education, absolutely.
So I'm putting my money on the next generation. As I mentioned, it's like the, the millennials, uh, well, which I am, uh, and the, the, the younger people I'm mentoring joining the industry, uh, I, I think they're going uh, to make this happen. And uh, uh, I expect less resistance with them than, than the, 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 the current workers right now. Yes, sir. Perhaps maybe we can uh, look at the mining sustainability in a broader way, including responsible mining, ethical mining, and, and accountability, transparency, democratization. Especially, you have a project in Africa. Then, how can a mining operation contribute to this uh, ethical or, or transparency, uh, democratization in a country? Because mining, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia, has a bad yeah, that's also true. Also, we need to change ourselves in that manner. And what do you think from your experience with some? Yeah. What's happening? What the, what kind of companies are doing for ethical mining? Um, so the um, I gotta go back to my son ICMM because they are doing. Uh, I mean, they are the, the poster uh, boy of the, the mining companies, right? That the things I've seen with uh, companies I, I deal with, the BHP, Rio Tinto, those companies. Uh, they are not the ones that we should worry about. I mean, they really embrace this at least. They, they're fighting f regularly on a day-to-day -day basis, training their people, and uh, definitely, uh, uh, I say, good traction. It's the, and again, on the ICMM's website, there's a good uh, article on how the artisanal mining, the, the smaller mining companies, the, the, the junior mining companies that usually have bigger impact because they don't have the same funding to respect all the legislations on that. So uh, I, I think you know when, when we focus on the big big ones uh, because that's, that's easy easy targets. But there's the whole uh, the second league of the, the mining companies that have a lot of uh, impact negative impact unfortunately. Yes. How do we decide how many mines we can open when yeah. like switch to finance? Like is it possible to leave two or like we need to respect the environment too? Like what's your yeah. So the studies have been have been done to say, you know, if you wanna go with this twenty fifty objective or twenty thirty five objective but fully electric, uh, the we know the gap of how many uh, well lithium, cobalt, that 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 uh, graphite, uh, those mines we have to them and the government made those uh, uh, min uh, minerals and metals, they come up with term critical minerals. So the, uh, the challenge is, is, is not how many is, how fast can we open them? Because as we speak, and that's the, the I part of my AIM framework, investment touches that, it's the, it takes 15 to 20 years to open a new mine. From finding it to bringing the production to 15 to 20 years. So let's say that you find uh, an amazing copper mine. It's, it, 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 we, won't, we won't be ready for that. So the, the gap analysis, I'm not too worried about the gap analysis. It's the, the, it's the, the, the execution rates. That, that's the problem right now. Thank you, Monica. Very enlightening uh, you know, discussion and conversation. I'm sure lots of you have many more questions, perhaps. I don't know if you have a little bit of time to stick around. I will stick around, absolutely. Yeah. Continue this conversation. Yeah, I want to talk about that uh, price thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> and thank you, Rocco, uh, for, for uh, helping us organize today's event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.